Um, so Frank and I um, are very pleased to be here with you today and we'd like to begin um, with an acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the lands on which we live and work, uh, the Wurundjeri, the Boonarong and the Wadawurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging and extend those respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, First Nations people that may be with us today. We feel that it's, it is very important to make this acknowledgement in this con context today for a couple of reasons, or for three reasons. Uh, firstly, to point to the continuing over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and young people in Australia's out-of-home care system and the assimilation policies, the intergenerational trauma and discrimination, the forced child rem removals and the poverty that have and unfortunately continue to contribute to this situation. Secondly, we want to emphasise the intergenerational impacts the system and its record keeping has on Indigenous and on non-Indigenous families and the need to strive for a system that can deliver better outcomes for all. And thirdly, to acknowledge claims and moral rights to land that are separate from legal title and ownership and ask how we might think in the same way about care records in recognition of rights to childhood identity, memory, family, cultural connection and accountability. So Frank uh, and I are here today, uh, not just because we meet the Elizabeth um, criteria. Um, my middle name's Elizabeth, Frank's wife's name is Elizabeth, so <laughs> we're part of the club. Um, yeah. Um, so we're here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're here to talk about what's happening in Australia around care system record keeping um, from advocacy and research perspectives and perhaps to tell um, a story about how they come together. Uh, so these issues are global as we're finding out today and we're keen to connect what we're doing um, with others as we are stronger tackling the complex challenges around care records together. Uh, so it is going to be a bit of a tag team. Uh, Frank's going to talk about the care lever community advocacy and activism that has raised awareness of the ongoing impacts um, that denial of access to and control over childhood records bring. I'll talk a little about the setting this record straight for the Rights of the Child Initiative, our 2017 summit and its outcomes, and then together we'll highlight a few things that have happened since. So here you go, over to you, Frank. Thank you, Joanna. Um, there's another Elizabeth in, in this picture too. Um, I wrote a book about my experiences called Norphan's Escape. Uh, Norphan's Escape, that's what we call them. Um, and it was in fact uh, my way out of uh, being a state ward in, in Victoria, Australia. I won a travelling scholarship to come to the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. So, <laughs> that's giving away my age a bit. Uh, the other thing that um, I thought to comment on hearing the really excellent uh, presentations this morning from the care leavers was um, I make a distinction between lived experience and living experience. So for me, uh, I had 3,987 days as a state ward of, of the state of Victoria. That's my lived experience. Uh, the living experience is 65 years or so afterwards puzzling over why I had that experience when I had, uh, I had family, I had parents who seemed reasonably good people to me. So that distinction between the lived experience, writing about what actually happened day to day, as opposed to thinking about why it happened and why it was necessary, why did you have such a strange life, I think is the, is the thing that, uh, that I talk most about and think most about. Just a couple of background points uh, for those of you who are not uh, uh, familiar with Australia. Um, child welfare in Australia is a state's matter. There's very little national coordination under the Constitution. And that makes getting a national approach to child welfare uh, really problematic as the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse, which finished in 2017, uh, found. <clears throat> However, most states actually have adopted policies and practices which, um, you, which would resonate with you. The stories I heard this morning offered no surprises. They were really interesting and insightful, but they offered no surprises to me at all. And that's because, of course, Australia is an outpost of Britain and the policies about um, the deserving and the undeserving poor and, and the neglected and criminal children. Um, <clears throat> the uh, 
the need for uh, control of children as opposed to care of children. They're, they're um, themes that uh, we talk about all the time in Australia. So forgive me for saying, and I don't mean to put you down at all, but you didn't shock me uh, at all in what you said today. It's a very, very similar situation in Australia. Um, likewise, in the period 1920 to 1980, more than half a million uh, Australian children were taken into out-of-home care or out-of-home control, uh, including the stolen generation that we've referred to of Indigenous children and child migrants from um, Britain and Malta also included in that. The system in Australia, and I put system in inverted commas, is a complex mix of orphanages, children's homes, um, missions, um, foster care, adoption, uh, kinship care, which has become much more uh, prevalent these days. Uh, records about these children were kept, um, and if they were made in the first place, they were kept in a very haphazard fashion. Uh, all the things that we've just heard, very typical of Australia, as the Royal Commission found. So uh, Joanne and I prepared this talk uh, three or four weeks ago, and uh, having listened to the conversations this morning, I might have presented this slightly differently. But I, I'm just imagining that if you, uh, if you leave care with those sentiments, being angry, ashamed, confused about your identity, not understanding the reasons why you were there, wanting to reconnect with your family, carrying unresolved burdens about how you were treated as a child for the physical, emotional and sexual abuse and neglect, archive records might be the storehouse of hope that would answer those questions for you. But your hopes are often dashed for all the same sorts of reasons that we've already heard this morning. Records have been lost, destroyed. Yes, we had those fires too. And the feral, the feral rats and the floods. Uh, inaccurate, incomplete or misleading information, very prevalent in, in the records that people receive. Many redactions, sometimes the very information you want my brother, for example, in one, the only letter my mother ever wrote to the authorities. The second paragraph mentions my brother. I couldn't see that letter for 11 years. I just fought. You don't give in. The facts that were recorded, but they're not explained. So you get a list of uh, places that you were placed in. But it doesn't tell you why you were shifted from one place. There's no interpretation of that, just a fact. And overwhelmingly negative. So children were problems, so were their parents. Never any bright, positive things about us. And the voice of the child is never heard. You see, um, all the things that have already been said, and that's why I, we find it not uh, surprising um, to hear what we've said. But then we had this um, on this slide showing a series of inquiries and um, activities, some of which were brought about by care leavers themselves, uh, strong advocacy, uh, skillful use of the media, uh, and so on. And those uh, reports, and I, I won't go through them all, but um, you can see they've, they've had a significant impact on the um, public awareness and uh, uh, institutional awareness, feelings of guilt and uh, you know, shame uh, in the institutions though they handle things so ba very badly. Uh, in some cases, the, uh, for example, the 2010, um, from 2010 onwards, after a national apology from the Prime Minister Rudd at the time, I think we had about six in the space of four years, <laughs> but it was Rudd at that time giving a national apology, first to the Indigenous stolen generation and then to the, um, the non-Indigenous um, children and child migrants, led to some um, national projects. Uh, a, a national history project, a national museum, travelling exhibition, uh, and a Find and Connect project, which uh, some of you may know something about. It's a, it's a wonderful um, tool, uh, collecting as much information as, as can be found about where records are uh, and who has them and how you might apply for them. won't give you a personal record, but it certainly gives you a good starting point as to uh, where the records for your institution might be. 
in every case with all of those inquiries, the terms of reference didn't begin with um, examination of records, but in every case, they finished up making a strong statement about that. It was very obvious to all the inquiries that records were a, a real problem. The lack of records, the way records were kept, all the things that, that we showed on the, on the slides there. And, and the Royal Commission itself in 2017 had put out a discussion paper and a consultation paper on records uh, partway through its inquiry. The creation and management of accurate, rec accurate records are systemic and enduring problems. Problems in access have not been overcome by reforms in response to recommendations of earlier inquiries. And this Royal Commission, which didn't start off with the intention of having a report on records, actually produced a separate uh, volume of the report on records. So I now hand back to Joanne. Thanks, Frank. Um, so for me, as a, an archives and record keeping uh, researcher, educator and professional, um, I'm pretty passionate about records and record keeping, to hear of the ongoing failure of our systems to meet identity, memory and accountable needs um, for children and for childhoods um, has been game and, and life-changing. It's led to a critical questioning of the social constructs, the power differentials, the values and the ethics that are embedded in our existing record-keeping, archiving and research infrastructure and ask what can be done about it. So while acknowledging the reforms that have led to some much needed improvements, systemic problems, those that are of the system, require systemic solutions. There's a need to tackle the structures that are holding the knottiest parts of the problem in place. And so we're part of a community that believes we need to redesign record keeping and archiving around acknowledging, respecting and enacting multiple rights in records. <coughs> so through an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship and with substantive funding from the Faculty of IT at Monash, we were able to establish the Setting the Record Straight for the Rights of the Child initiative in conjunction with key community advocacy organisations, uh, CLAN, also the Child Migrants Trust, Connecting Home, which is a, a Stolen Generations advocacy and support service, and the CREATE Foundation, which represents children and young people in statutory care and also supporting um, young, younger care leavers. And also with our allied research centres, the East Scholarship Research Centre at the University of Melbourne, who um, run the Find and Connect web resource, and also the Collaborative Research Centre in the Australian History of uh, in, in Australian history, uh, circa at the Federation University Australia. And so together we worked towards holding a national summit in May 2017 to bring together a range of community, organisational, government and professional perspectives to discuss how we could transform the way records for childhood out-of-home care are created, captured, managed, archived and accessed to meet um, those lifelong identity, memory and accountability needs. So we came together at Federation Square in Melbourne, uh, a statement space, as you can see from the picture there, listening and learning on day one from those with direct experiences of the failings of record-keeping and archiving systems, and then on day two on imagining a better future. Our mantra was that we needed to make the summit future-focused, and so we set the potential outcomes from early on, wanting to have a long-term, a 10-year transformation plan centred on designing and implementing independent, lifelong living archives for those who have had or will experience out-of-home care. We're extremely pleased that we achieved support for this way forward by those at the event um, with backing for the development of a summit communique and a strategic plan. Uh, and these, plus a more detailed report of the event, are available on our website, uh, along with four short videos. Um, I've just highlighted a couple here. Um, one, um, particularly looking at an Aboriginal perspective, um, the particular cultural issues for stolen generations and Aboriginal um, children and young people currently in care, and also um, the CREATE Foundation CEO, Jackie Reid, uh, discussing the record-keeping issues for uh, those currently in care at the moment. So, what is the plan? Well, this wonderful illustration from the sketch note taker at the event, Matt McGann, I think captures brilliantly the shifts in record keeping and archiving in the care sector that we discussed in the planning the future sessions at the summit. And it was and continues to be inspirational for me. Um, 
So the vision is in the summit strategy is that we need a national framework for record keeping for childhood out of home care to apply to the records of yesterday, today and tomorrow and across all jurisdictions. Um, that issue with legislation, as Frank says, each state and territory has different child protection legislation, different privacy legislation, freedom of information <laughs> protection, archives and records um, legislation. So it's a really complex cocktail and too often the jurisdiction card is used um, to, uh, for inaction. So we're looking at this being a socio-technical framework um, featuring the translation of key policy components into a technical architecture for participatory record keeping and archiving. And it begins with the then anticipated, um, but now actual record keeping principles for child safe organisations that came out of our Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse. But it enlarges on those with interconnected action and advocacy and research and development agendas to progress um, the idea of distributed yet integrated inclusive record keeping systems so that those with care experiences can participate in the creation of their records, exert their rights to identity, memory, accountability <coughs> and privacy in their ongoing management access and use. Haven't got time to go into all the details, um, so just selected um, uh, three things to highlight. The first um, is uh, the uh, record keeping principles for child safe organisations that the Royal Commission handed down. Uh, they had, prior to the release of the final report, um, they had already delivered a set of 10 standards for child safe organisations, which were in the process of being turned into a nationally endorsed statement of principles that it was pushed to go beyond just sexual abuse to cover all, for, all forms of potential harm by Australia's uh, Children's Commissioner. Um, and hoping, and it's not only the record keeping professionals in the audience here that can see that they have record keeping implications written all over them. So on behalf of the initiative, we put in a submission uh, to the Human Rights Commission consultation process to highlight that. I'm pleased that in the final ver version, which has just recently been endorsed by COAG, which is our Council of Australian Governments, that um, we went from three mentions of record keeping to 12 mentions of record keeping. And we're also aware um, as uh, that from the speeches from the commissioners discussing the importance of record keeping in their deliberations, plus the draft set of records and record keeping principles in the consultation paper earlier, that these two things were likely to come together in the final report. Uh, which indeed they were. Volume 8 um, emphatically states that rec good record keeping is an important part of making and supporting institutions to be child safe. And so that argument about this being on top of your day job, no, it should actually be integrated into everybody's day job. And they delivered um, what I feel are actually a, a cleverly crafted um, set of, revised set of record keeping principles for child safety and wellbeing. And um, hats off to them because they did push beyond the limitations of their terms of reference, which was restricted to child sexual abuse, to do some justice to what they heard in the private and public testimonies of other forms of abuse and neglect, along with um, the personal record keeping needs, particularly for those with care experiences. Uh, they also charge state and territory governments with requiring all institutions that engage in child related work to comply with these principles. Um, and for oversight bodies in each state and territory to be responsible for monitoring and enforcing compliance with the principles. And so this is a potentially far reaching mandate for record keeping. And I think it's really up to the Australian archival and record keeping community to step up to the mark and seize this opportunity that has been created to implement them. Um, we need to um, ask ourselves some hard questions about whether we can meet these principles under existing systems bearing in mind that systemic and enduring problems are not fixed by a few tweaks. Um, and also with these principles, what better systems um, can we design and what better oversight um, can we have of those systems as well too, given what we've heard about the lack of oversight of record keeping. So back, back to Frank to talk a little about the second element of the proposed national framework, which is the rights charter. Thank you again. Um, we're developing a, a charter of rights in records, uh, which we hope will have a significant impact on the record makers, holders, uh, and so on. I'm, I'm going to skip over this very quickly because I know we're, we're pushed for time. Uh, 
Um, it, it actually starts with the Clan Charter of Rights. This is a care leaver organisation in which said, well, rights are not actually given to people often. You have to take them. You have to know what your rights are and assert them and actually assert them in terms of practical outcomes. So CLAN developed a, in 2016, 2015-16, a, a set of uh, rights and core principles, including those three, which I, I particularly th think are relevant to the, the situation that I've been hearing this morning. The right to challenge inaccurate, misleading, out-of-date or incomplete records. The right to define your experiences in your own words and terms. And that's actually built into some of the freedom of information, rights to information legislation in Australia, where if you are given your personal records and you think they are inaccurate, misleading or out of date or uh, insufficient, then you actually have the right. A lot of our care leaver members are not using that right, uh, partly because they think, so what? If I, if I write my version of the story, who's going to read it? So they actually prefer, many people prefer to write their own story in their own way out of the record system. Uh, and uh, at last count, we have over 100 memoirs or short versions of uh, life stories uh, written by older care leavers in Australia. Uh, the second principle of control, the right to know who's accessing your, uh, your file and why, and to veto readers. We say, it's not open slather. Nobody should re read my record, my personal record, unless I say it's okay for them. And then lastly, and the one we've had the most difficulty with, the most resistance, is the ownership. The right to full and unredacted access to all personal documents, including all originals of family letters and photos and so on. It's my record. Uh, and, and so often we're told it's not your record, it's about you, but it's our record about you. So we're fighting that battle, as you can imagine. But in the meantime, following the summit and the work we've done with Monash University and Federation University, uh, we're going for this bigger uh, picture um, uh, rights in records uh, uh, approach. Um, this is just a, a, a bit of a mock-up to show you the, the way we're looking at it. On the left-hand side, the human rights that we think are appropriate in the area of uh, record keeping. And on the right-hand side, specific aspects of record keeping, which we say are our rights. You can't possibly read all of that, um, but it is available and uh, on the website and we can give you the details of that. And you can see how the, the four parts of, uh, of um, this re rights in records by design uh, fit to make a, 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 a total package. And Joanne, I think you're going to just say a few words about this. Thanks, Frank. So yes, the Rights Charter is one element um, of the ARC-funded Rights and Records by Design project. We have to get that um, acknowledgement of that funding in when we, when we have to. Uh, pursuing these different lines of inquiries um, as progress towards um, that national framework. Um, the other one with, that we wanted to make mention of today um, is uh, the co-design and prototyping of components of a lifelong living archives architecture um, that uh, I, I'm involved with, with a wonderful um, co-design team. Uh, uh, they are uh, Rhiannon, Ella, Liz, Matt, Aidan and Greg and Hahn. And what we're looking at doing is building a demonstrator of rights-based record keeping. And it's about turning that rights charter into a rights engine. Um, and we're in the process of building um, the tentatively titled My System as a demonstrator of what might be possible if a child, young person in care, or an adult who has left care actually has their own record keeping system to interact with those of departments, placement agencies, healthcare professionals, schools, even families and carers and all others in the care system. Um, because one of the things that we kept on hearing was everybody else has a system um, that they're putting records into and you're a client or the subject of that system. But what happens if you actually have your system which is demanding that your rights, your record keeping rights actually be um, uh, fulfilled through interaction? Um, and I, I guess I've got some notes here of, of hearing this morning about um, uh, what Rosie was saying about how when something is recorded about you, you have a say in it. 
it and control over who can access it. Um, uh, John George saying the issue of how the, the relationship with the file is an ongoing one. So you, you have this um, capacity to access it when you need it, to put it away when you don't need it. And as designers, we've been sort of challenged by that notion that it might be years and years that may, may go through. And so what does that mean in terms of things like passwords and identity and accessing it again? So some really, what we think are actually really challenging um, IT design issues there as well too. Um, Sam, I wanted to say at the summit we also heard um, from how care files get used against you um, as, a, as a young parent as well too. That was a strong message that we heard from some young mothers about what that, that meant for them with their child immediately um, going, wanting, being, uh, going into care. Um, and Brett, a way to bring together that patchwork of records, um, not just the ones that are in the department um, uh, and the agency files, but those other records that, that make up um, those experiences. And um, as Victoria also said, um, access is not a, not a single moment, it's a, it's a process. Um, and that it's completely individualised. How do we actually build a system which doesn't sort of try and be normative, but acknowledges that everybody's situation is unique and how they want to interact with their records um, is unique. Um, so we're working on that at the moment um, and hopefully um, by the end of the year um, we, should, we hope to have something that we want to share and have continuing conversations because we're just a small research project. Um, so what we have is going to be very much a, a sort of sticky tape and lollipop sticks um, demonstrator, um, but it's there to, to be, yeah, that game changer if we think about the way that we design these systems differently with a person's own um, record keeping system, how can that change things? So I guess uh, the, in terms of transformative solutions, I think we need to be uh, focused on what participatory record keeping is all about, how we can design systems around respecting and enacting multiple rights and records, that we think about the smart, clever use of digital and networking technologies and co-design and co-research that we actually work with the expertise of living experience um, to the fore. And so just back to Frank um, to conclude. Thank you. The past hasn't done with us yet and we haven't done with the past. In Australia we've started a national redress scheme for children who were sexually abused. Other forms of abuse and neglect are not included, but uh, it's a start. Uh, and, and what we find now is that another set of personal records are being made. And all the questions that we thought we'd, we'd dealt with uh, are coming back again to haunt us. These records are being made, they're being passed on to other people that we don't know, and they're used for decisions about us, how much money we will get and what counselling services will be available to us. They're stored somewhere in, for some indeterminate future. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> it truly is the case that the past uh, isn't finished with us. Uh, but uh, there is, there's some good news from time to time. The New South Wales uh, Commissioner, um, Information and uh, Privacy Commissioner, issued a, 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 a direct, oh, well, she called it a, a guideline, um, but it, in fact it hopefully will be a directive to the New South Wales record uh, holding uh, community that, um, uh, that there ought to be much more sensitivity, uh, much more uh, uh, use of discretionary criteria in, in the Government Information Privacy Act, the JIPA there, um, and, and we think that's a very healthy approach to actually say, let's not hide behind the law, let's use your discretion. If a person needs a record, give them the record for God's sake. Why else are you holding it? It's, it's to help them. So that's good news coming out of the a response to the Royal Commission uh, report on, on uh, records. And that needs, need no further. <laughs> Thank you for listening.